Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 141, first time, tips for playing a new game right out of the box. I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash Tabletop Bellhop. All right, tonight we've got a question from a frustrated gamer looking for tips and tricks, unboxing and learning a game for the first time at the table with the players you're expected to play that game with. Well, as always, we recommend learning a game ahead of time. We do have some suggestions for those that can't. After that conversation, we've got a couple of reviews we're going to do tonight, which are actually a good follow-up to last week's episode where we talked about word-based party games. So I'll be sharing my thoughts on Jabuka and Trap Words from CGE and a bit of comparison of Trap Words to Letter Jam, just because I happen to get both games at the same time. Uh, we finish off with our usual week in review with actual in-person gaming events, including plays of Riff Raff, Unfair, Space Base, Trap Words, Codenames Duet, Tapestry, and a bit more Jabuka. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Thank you everyone for your feedback, even if we don't read it out on the show. First up, a quick comment from James Spawn, the designer of White Star, which we re we've reviewed in the past. James dropped this on our top 10 of the top 1000 topic. The Duke is one of my favorite board games of all time. We totally agree. All of us here love the Duke, uh, even though I think it's probably been quite a while since any of us have played the Duke. We should probably fix that. Well, Chris McGuinness commented on our talk about board game tournament formats, where we described the great Canadian board game Blitz format to say, I'm new to your feed and blog. Really good write up on this. This, it has me missing in-person play. Maybe next year at the Niagara event, we could get a Blitz going. Well, thanks for the comment, Chris. Uh, so far, we have not attended any events in Niagara, but that's definitely something we could consider. Uh, we made the drive up to uh, Buffalo before, which we drive through Niagara, so it's a little closer. It's even closer for Sean. So maybe that's something to consider next year. At this point, we're not going anywhere near you, United States. Sorry. Glad to hear someone else out there, though, does dig the Blitz format. It's really fun. Um I, I dig it. Like, that's why we spent the whole episode talking about it. And same goes for conventions, too. Sorry, that's in Canada. I don't even know. I think, that if I remember correctly, the event Chris is talking about, and the reason I meant the U.S. is it's actually a con that's split over both borders. And it's called, like, the Border Con or something. And you can actually walk across a bridge to see the falls and go to the U.S. half. And, like, you, you get this special what do you call it customs thing that lets you go back and forth while you're at the con and stuff like that so i'm not going to any canadian cons either it's, it's not just against the u.s i just don't need to be that people-y at least for till next year fair enough and well we can't even get into the united states for another 30 days at least anyway true well stuff uh bez of stuff by bez commented on our word game topic from last week to say fun list there are four games here that I've not played and I'll have to properly look into. Nice. Hopefully one day my L deck will be more widely available and a few of its games might be suitable for a list like this. Now, for those of you who haven't heard of it, which is probably most of you, and it included me when I first got this comment, the L system is a game system. It's a specific deck of cards where each card has a pair of letters on it. Now, Bez hosts contests pretty much every year, not counting the last couple, in which designers create games using his L deck. There are seven games that have been published at this point with more to come. Now, most of the info about this isn't actually on like an L page or anything. It's on the Whip Bell Plus Plus Board Game Geek page. And the reason it's on that page is it was the first game published using an L deck. So what I'll do is I'll drop a link to that in the show notes if anyone wants to dig into Bez's L deck. And that's Wibble, W-I-B-B-E-L-L, -L, and then plus plus as symbols. Now, Gene Chu left a comment about our Shy Pluto's Space Base expansion unboxing. Mm -hmm. I love how this expansion has an interesting way of introducing all of the new cards and mechanics. Yeah. It does one mechanic set of cards at a time, it makes it so that the new cards have a really good chance of seeing play 
so players can experience these cards and mechanics when they are introduced. Uh, thanks, Gene. And ironically, we were talking about this in our chat room just before the show started up. This is something I don't think I actually mentioned before when talking about playing through the bit of Shy Pluto we have. And no spoilers, uh, since this is part of the rule book that you read. You read seven pages before you play your first game. But the game actually starts with everyone getting their first card from a specific set of new cards. Later, as things are unlocked, instead of just adding them into the decks and shuffling them in, you actually put them in with the market. And this is a great way to make sure the players get to see the new stuff. And not only is it cool to make sure like, oh, I get new thing and I get to use it right away, which is nice, but it also makes sure everyone gets the new rules as they come up. So it's like, not it's not one of those cases where, hey, we've had an expansion and there's now this red robot that does extra damage and can move really quick, but there's no red robots in the game and they may not come up until the very end or it might not come up until your third play and by then you forgot what the red robots do. So I think it's really cool that the rules are going to come up right away so they don't just show up later. And honestly... Uh, here's a lesson for all game designers, developers, publishers. This is something you should be doing with your games. Honestly, I don't understand why this is a standard in video game design, mm -hmm. yet still a rarity in board games. Uh, it just boggles my mind. I'm, I'm just playing another game recently where I'm in a uh, campaign mode and every once in a while, they'll just suddenly bring me into a tutorial because they're introducing a new mechanic. Something new. Yeah. And, you know, even though I've been playing the game for, you know, hours. Uh, next up, some unhappy bail about Tapestry. Jay Behrens writes, I was very disappointed by this game, given all the hype it has received. It didn't help that one of the factions was broken. Did they ever fix the Time Lords or whatever they're called? Well, I appreciate the comment, Jay, and I'm sorry you didn't dig the game. Not every game is for everyone. Else. Everyone, we've said that many times. Though I think in many cases, the biggest problem with this particular game is uh, missed expectations or wrong expectations. And I don't know on whose part those are. If Stonemeyer set up the bad expectations or players just heard Civilization game and expected a certain thing. Like I have a feeling most people were looking for the next Through the Ages or the next uh, Clash of Cultures. Well, also with Civ building games, that's not at all the way Tapestry is. It's very different from that. Now, as for broken factions, Jamie has noted that he knew there would be problems with the factions right from the start when the game came out. There is no way no designer could possibly play test all 380,000 possible, 380,000, yes, 380,000 possible faction combinations. And that's 380,000, sorry, 380,000 possible combinations at game start. That doesn't even take into the fact that there are tapestry cards and parts on the track where you can add multiple factions to one player. Like it just blows up in that. There's just no way they could have tested everything. Now, what he has done, which I think is brilliant, is he has created a living document that has modifiers for each faction based on the results of everyone who's been playing the game. Now, the last time this was updated was in March this year, and there are currently 14 factions that have rules changes listed. Now, I don't see a Time Lords faction, so I'm not sure exactly which faction Jay is talking about, but the Chosen is the one that has the biggest swing. They get 15 points per other player in the game to make them balanced. And we actually saw this in our last game, where someone started with 60 more points than anyone else. And to be honest, they came in second and were close to running. So it actually seemed pretty balanced. And I know he's fixed a bunch of the other factions. Now, what I do encourage is anyone that does play this game, there's a link in the book. You can go log your play. Let Jamie know which factions people played, which one. You could just do the nice quick one where that's it. Or there's a long form version where you can actually put what points you got. So that way he can keep tweaking this. All right. Well, next, I've got a comment from our review last week, the second edition of World's Fair 1893. Mm -hmm. Cohort 7 Games writes, this is currently the most played game in our collection as it's been easy to teach to new gamers as well as enjoyable even on what is now our 52nd play. Wow. Love World's Fair 1893. Nice. And as noted in the review, if you love the original, this new one is just more of the same with the bonus of some more diverse historical figures, but completely unchanged gameplay. So if you like the original, you'll love the new one just as much. 
To finish up, we've gotten some feedback on our new YouTube thumbnail format. <laughs> Ryan Shoon writes, Motuzno, I like your new thumbnails quite a bit. Well, thanks, Ryan. Uh, it's good to hear a couple things here. One, that people have noticed the difference. So it's shown up and people seem to dig it. I admit I was skeptical. Like I, the whole, everyone knows you're supposed to put your face on your YouTube videos. People respond better to faces and they recognize them. And I've heard that uh, for more years than I've actually recorded anything even worth putting up on YouTube. And I just, I don't know, having my mug on anything just kind of bugged me. But I sat down based on a, a thread in a Facebook insider group. And I'm like, I'm going to try it. So I sat there and I grabbed some pictures Deanna had taken. And I, I put my face up big, bold next to our, our branding up above. And I'm like, you know what? That doesn't look that bad. And then Deanna came in. She's like, you know, that kind of works. So we went with it. Um, at this point, I've developed three different images that are ready so we can at least mix it up. So it's not going to be the same pose every time. So get used to seeing my mug on uh, YouTube more often. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. A couple of announcements before we move on to our main topic. So next week, we are going to be celebrating our third anniversary here live on Twitch Wednesday night. Now, while our sorry. actual anniversary is the 26th, we wanted to be able to celebrate with you, our fans, so we're going to hold off a couple of days until the 28th. Now, for this special episode, we are going to deviate from our regular format a bit and have some special things planned. Now, one of those is going to be announcing our next game giveaway. Space Base ends this week. We're going to start something up. We're going to try to find something suitable of celebrating this milestone. Now, to find out what game it is, you're just going to have to join us. Then in our Ask the Bellhop segment, instead of answering one of your questions, we're going to do the typical thing podcasters do when they hit anniversaries and do a bit of a retrospective, talking about what we accomplished in the last year, some milestones we reached, uh, games we've discovered, uh, what our most played games are, etc. We don't know exactly what those numbers will be, but we're probably not going to just bore you with subscriber counts. Trust me, we'll try to make it interesting. Then, instead of moving on to feature reviews, which is what we like to do every show, right? Two to three featured reviews. Two to three. Wow, I'm jumping ahead. Well, I'm not even jumping ahead, like, <laughs> into the future where we start. One to two featured reviews every episode. We're actually going to drop that for next week. We're going to swap over to an AMA format and answer questions from the lobby, our chat room here on Twitch, trying to keep the celebration vibe going and give a reason for people to show up. Here's your chance to interact with us. And answer, get your questions answered live. And since it's a party, we'll definitely be doing questions. We'll answer anything. It doesn't even have to be gaming related. Then we'll finish up with our usual weekend review just because I don't want to miss it. I still want to highlight what we've been playing. I got lots of games planned for this weekend, so I still want to talk about what we've been playing. And then we'll have our usual patron shout out in closing. We would love to see a packed lobby for this mm -hmm. show just so we can say thank you to all of you awesome people our fans, our lobbyists, who make this all worth doing. Now, finally, I do want to welcome any and all of you to join us for an after-show Zoom party, where we're going to open up our Zoom meeting that we use to record the show to our guests, so our fans can join us and we can interact in real time. A digital three-year anniversary party. Video on, drinks in hand, totally optional, but I know I'll be grabbing a beer. Hope to see you there. Now, due to having a party next Wednesday, we decided that stopping in the middle of the show to do a review or two would just kind of ruin the mood, right? Like, here we are, we're interacting with everyone, it's great, we're awesome. Okay, and now I want to tell you about this game. It just wouldn't feel right. So we're going to try something different next week because of, the sh because of that with the show. So instead of recording our weekly reviews during the show, we're instead going to do a separate review-only mm -hmm. live show on Thursday night. Same bat time, same bat channel, just different bat day. We welcome you all to join us as we review Unfair from Good Games Publishing and Tapestry from Stonemeyer Games. Now, again, that's Thursday, the 29th, 9 p.m. Eastern. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight's question comes from tabletop bellhop patron Jeff Zeus, who writes, it's common advice that you should learn a game before you get it to the table and bore two or three other people trying to learn it. But some folks may find it hard to sit with a game alone and really figure it out. Also, 
Sometimes you're at a public play event and want to try something nobody at your table owns. Have you any tips for a group trying to unbox and learn a game together for the first time? Well, thanks, Jeff, for the great question and, of course, for your support as one of our patrons. Now, I want to start off with the first thing Jeff said there, because this is something I feel pretty strongly about, something we have talked about going like episodes back. We've been talking about this forever. You really should not only try to learn a game before showing up to play it, but also do all the prep work that's required, like punching things out, sorting the components into baggies, all of that before it hits the table for play. Like this is something I think came up in our second podcast ever, and we've repeated many times on the show. Doing that extra prep is worth it. There are multiple reasons for this, but first of all, it just makes you look better in so many ways. Organized, knowledgeable, and prepared people have a better experience and are going to have a better experience and will always be looking forward to having other people play with you when you're more prepared. Mm. That being said, there are always going to be edge cases yeah. and friends uh, are the ones who are going to be accepting, supportive and encouraging when things don't go just right. Now, the second part of Jeff's question, though, does lead me to clarify what we've said in the past about this in a way I don't think has actually come up, which leads me to my first true tip. You the game owner, the person with the game, the person who bought it, it shows up at your house. You don't have to be the one to do all the work. Now, maybe this goes back to the thing Roger mentioned last week in our feedback um, about the endowment effect where you want to hold on to things that are in your hand and you put undue value in being a game owner. Like it's a, it's a psychological thing that you might want to try to overcome because a game is something that a group of people are going to enjoy together. And to that end, those people should work together to enjoy the game. So there shouldn't be any pressure or requirement for the game owner to do all that work, to open it, unpackage it, rebox it, learn it, understand it, download rule updates, check the FAQ, get player aids, laminate player sheets. Well, it's going to be physically easier for the owner to do this, at least when they first get the game, because of the ones would start with it in their hand. There is no reason you can't pass that game off to someone in your group who's more interested in doing that additional work if you're not interested in it yourself. Now, of course, some of you might have very mm. strong feelings about who can and can't unbox a game that you paid for. And some people may not even have a regular game group. Mm -hmm. They may play solo much of the time and bring games out to the FLGS to find players. But for the rest of you... So here's a thought right? Have your regular game night, play your games, play whatever you want to play, play whatever you picked up two weeks ago, something you prepped and everyone knows ahead of time. And then before everyone goes home, put all of the new hotness on the table, yours, whatever Sean's picked up, Deanna's latest game, throw them on the table and divvy it up, share the responsibility evenly between the players or work with the players who you know, enjoy learning and teaching and punching games if that's your group like if there's two people do it split it between them if three people do it split between them if no one really likes doing it share the wealth share the pain work on it all together maybe even take things a step further and open stuff up at the end of your game night like have an unboxing period at the end of your regular game night and open them up punch them but leave the learning for later that way, the game learner or whoever's going to learn and teach the game can just take the rule books. That way, you're not hauling games back and forth or worrying about someone else taking your game that you just bought. And that way, everyone can unpunch their own games, too. Now, again, you could share the work of getting games ready to play, too. If you've got multiple games you're going to open up, one person cuts the strength, the next starts punching stuff, a third's putting stuff into baggies, and fourth player's gathering up the rule materials. Like, these aren't hard and fast rules. Obviously, you're going to change it depending on how many people you have in your group or what resources and what stuff comes in the games. One of the big changes in learning, the learning aspect, is YouTube, of course. Rule mm -hmm. books are something that more and more are reference material to check during the game and not how we learn games. Yes. It's certainly easy enough to pick your preferred online game teacher or even one recommended by the publisher nowadays and throw mm -hmm. it up on the TV or tablet for everyone to watch together. So there are those are a few tips for making sure the game gets learned and prepped before game night. But Jeff's real question is, what if that's not possible? For whatever reason, uh, there's no time. Your group just doesn't want to wait. You're at the game store and they got something new in. So you buy it and you just want to bring it to a table, play right away. 
um you fully plan to rule r- learn the rules and sit down and play a solo play but then something came up you get a call from where your dad lives it, it's gonna happen even i sit down at the table with new shrink wrap games now and then and try to learn it along with everyone else it happens to the best of us and of course the game matters too cracking the shrink on ticket to ride new york is a mm-hmm. matter of minutes while cracking the shrink on orleans is going to take you a little while yeah definitely true So my first tip when you're sitting down and everyone's like, oh, we have a new game in front of us. What do we do is basically a repeat of the last one. Start off by sharing the work, right? Crack open the shrink, open her up and dive in. Split the components up between the players. Have people punching, other people sorting. Have someone flip to the game setup section of the rule book, which is honestly usually the first page in. If you're really lucky, there's a separate sheet. And then you get things going, right? Like, work out the components, work it together, and try to get the game running as quickly as possible. This is actually one thing I wish publishers often did differently. Mm -hmm. Well, after a while, most people can set up the games they play regularly from memory. Even then, there are often details we forget. How many of this thing do you start off in a three-player game? How often have you heard something similar to that being Mm -hmm. said? We've all said it. I would just love to see either a one sheet or a separate page in the manual in every game that was just the setup. Nothing else. Easy to find. Step, 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 step. Don't hide it with a piece count or among the background information. Just give me the table setup details clean and clear. And it is not common. I have definitely seen it. Uh, Thank you, Vitell Resorta. And um, I think his... uh, Forgetting the name, Ian O'Toole as as the graphic designer. I think the two, the, they're a pair that tend to do a good job of it. Stonemire actually is usually rather good about it. Um, having reference material that works is a huge part of making a game easier to learn. Now, an alternative for this is if you're at a public play event or you have a big game group, right? Like you're getting together with eight, twelve people, not just like you and your three friends. Would be to sorry i'm mixing this up with the next one i this way get for not quite following the script so i'm i i am i'm jumping just a bit so alternative for this is if you're at a public play event and there is a person who's interested in learning the game right like i bought it but sean's like oh i don't mind sitting through that and reading it have them do that off to the side while everyone else is still playing something Now, this is what I do the most often at a public play event when I've got a new game I really want to share and I haven't had time, but I'm usually playing host anyway, right? I'm I'm there as the the Windsor Gaming Ambassador sharing the Windsor Gaming Resorts event, and I'm already watching for people coming in the doors and doing other things. I know I'm not going to play games the entire time I'm there. So I'm perfectly cool with spending, you know, 10, 20 minutes in a corner, punching something out and getting it set up on the table before calling people over. Now, this has the bonus of letting the game owner be the one punching it out which, like I said, is an issue. Some people take that very seriously, and I understand it. You're not having to worry about someone else ripping, tearing something, losing a piece, and plus, there's a whole thing about organizing the game how you want. The bad part is they're the only ones that are getting to touch and see the bits. That's actually why I prefer the shared experience is everyone's kind of seeing everything at the same time and touching it and getting the tact on, okay, those are the cubes. What are those cubes for? Okay, the cubes are for this. Um, you can also do this at a home game night, I guess. Though to me, having someone sit in the corner doing their own thing would feel odd at one of my events. But that could be perfectly normal for your group where someone sits off and plays Switch for a while between rounds. I don't know. Every game group's different. Nobody puts baby in the corner unless they're ne- learning the new game for later, and then it's okay. <laughs> now, next up, as for learning the game, you got it punched, you got it kind of organized, you've got it set up to the best of your ability. Again, all you've done is kind of look at the setup diagram, put things in place that kind of make sense. There's a few ways you can go, and I'm going to start off with the old school approaches, the stuff we've been using for years. Now, this gets to what I got confused on here, where if you're at a public group or you happen to be playing in a large group, right? You got 12 person game night, you got three different tables going. The first thing, and, and I find people are, are reluctant to do this, is to see if anyone else at the event knows the game and can teach it. Now, if you are playing at a local game store or a gaming cafe or something like that, this includes the staff at the venue. One of the biggest assets of playing in public play events or with large groups is that you get a pool of gamer knowledge and experience in one place. Use that. 
Like I've sat and seen people trying to frustratedly figure out a game, like just stand up and say, Hey, anyone know this game that they can teach me now jumping back to something we talked about. I don't even know how many episodes ago now. Well, about putting signs on tables for organizing public play events is having a sign system can really help with this, where you put a sign out that says, we're looking for someone to teach the game, but it doesn't hurt to ask. Like if you're at a local game store, go ask the staff, right? Like most local game stores have people on hand that can teach at least the demo copies of the games they have in the store, but often are more knowledgeable. And a, and a proper gaming cafe, like if you're going to Snakes and Lattes, they pay people to teach games that are there just for that reason. Though if you have just picked the new hotness hot off the shelf, yeah, you may not be able to find anyone. So Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Plus, the other thing, too, is you don't want to impose. I get it. That's the thing. But ask. And people can say no. And the other thing is, if you are someone who can teach games, realize you can say no. And realize, let me finish this game. I'll head over when I'm done is a valid response. Now, if you don't get lucky, you didn't find an available game teacher, you just bought the new hotness, so no one knows how to play it yet. Um, what I would do is sit at the table with the other players and say, is anyone a rule learner? Is anyone really good at absorbing rules and figuring games? So who's played the most games, right? They then do it on their own, right? They sit down, learn the game. Um, in general, I recommend this person do this as a solo experience um, and try to avoid reading the rules out to other players. While they're doing that, you can do some of the setup stuff, right? Like possibly punching things or getting cards ready and so on. If you can, only finish part of the rules. Like try not to devour the whole thing because you might be able to just read enough to get the game going. Like read setup, sit and do setup all together. Then read through like turn one. And then read through the next section. Like, because not every game needs you to read the entire rules in order to get playing. Fancy Flight's famous for this. They have these little quick start guides and they have reference guides. Try to get to the playing and using the references quickly. I also, again, recommend not reading. So have the player who's good at teaching read the rules and then summarize it to the other players. That way they can skip over the fiddly bits that aren't important. Like, why does this have to happen? No, just take three of these and put them here. Don't worry about why. We'll just get going. Now, the only time I would actually have someone read the rules is if everyone else at the table agrees to it. That'll never happen with Deanna at the table. You're just going to put her to sleep. With me, I'd be like, all right, go for it. I hate it. Like, I'd prefer, actually, generally, I'd say, just give me the rules. I'm going to go to the washroom, and I'll be back in 10 minutes. I'll have devoured most of it, so I'll be able to explain when I get back, right? Because you don't think about, like, like reading a 34 pages, like, ridiculously long instructions nowadays, unless you're sitting down to play a GMT war game, these rule books don't take that long to read. So I honestly think it's better to do it on your side. But if you do have a bunch of people who are perfectly cool at just sitting attentively and listening to you and soaking up rules, it's a rare skill, but go for it. Well, I'm actually not bad at this, but often the game can impact how well this uh, works. Some mm. games have so much required front-loaded knowledge yeah. that there's only so much summary you can do, and you're almost required to end up reading it out uh, anyway. Yeah, there's, it, it is so rough, right? Like, I'm just thinking back to when I was trying to teach tapestry, and I'm like, honestly, the first game, just do stuff, and I'll tell you what it does. Like, don't plan ahead. Don't try to figure out the icon. Just go, I'm going to go up the technology track, and I'll tell you what that icon means. Getting people to do that is sometimes harder. Now, if you don't have someone that's good at quickly absorbing rules and then teaching them to other people, then I suggest doing the break it up, right? That ha Pick someone to read through one section at a time. Try to learn while playing check to the setups right hand out all the player components read the actions you can take on a turn and and just like like play with it go here well what if you took a move action what would you do okay if you took this action what would you do try to get the game actually going and get people touching pieces interacting and moving things instead of just sitting there and this also stands for if you do have one person who learned the game get people playing and engaged you want people focused on the rules and not bored sitting waiting to learn like just get people doing stuff Again, though, this is one of those things that's going to be game dependent. Some games just don't always work that way. Yeah, that's true. Now, playing the game does lead me to a side note. This first game, you've just cracked the shrink. No one knows what they're doing is a learning game. No one's played before. The points don't matter. Who cares who wins? At this point, the goal of playing this game isn't to dominate the other players or to be the winner. Your goal of this game is to learn to play the game, to figure it out. This should be true for your first play of any game, to be honest, even if someone has learned the rules ahead of time, but even more so when everyone at the table is trying to learn the game at the same time. It's your first game. You are going to play extreme, but if you are careful and learn what has gone wrong, you'll be better for it. You'll all be better yeah, for it the next time around. 
So now we get to like, that's the old school approach, right? Right now we have the internet technology. It's ubiquitous. The thing is people forget it's there. I don't know how many times I've been at the local game store and gamers are sitting there taking pictures of the games they're playing, looking up FAQs and logging their plays on board game geek and texting their wives. But no one thinks to bring up a how to play video to watch when they don't know how to play a game. Like for most modern gaming groups, there's probably someone has a phone or a tablet on hand. And I do realize there are people that are underprivileged who do not have access to this. In that case, though, maybe you can ask the store. Store owner might have something, or maybe they have a computer that they can bring up. Set that in the middle of the table, load up, watch it played, Rado, gaming rules, whoever your favorite rule instruction videos are. Or alternatively, again, do the one person thing. Have one person watch an appropriate video and have them teach everyone else. Even better, if you know you're going to play ahead of time, remember this whole being prepared thing we talked about at the beginning, email or text everyone who's going to play a link to the video so everyone already knows as at least watched it once when they showed up. That's not the same of having to sit down, open, learn to play a game, set all the components and have it ready to go. That's a lot less work and something you can probably get buy-in for even for the laziest of players. And this goes for even if you just think you're going to buy it. Hey, you know what? On Saturday when we're at the FLGS, I'm, I'm, I've got the money. I think I'm going to pick up Tapestry. Mm-hmm. How about everybody watch this video before? That way we can start playing it exactly. when I get it on Saturday. Yeah, yep. There are two trains of thoughts for this. One, make sure everyone watches the same video mm. so that they're on the same page. Or let people watch different videos. Watch their own personal favorite mm-hmm. creator. As some videos do have mistakes or slightly different ways to do things. The yep. combined knowledge could work out to a better first game. But yeah, that's going to vary within uh, how you how you decide to, to work within your group. So I am, I am a learn from the book player always have been i am read the rules cover to cover sit down and what i do is i use watch it played videos sorry that i'm branding that i didn't mean to brand that I, I how to play videos after the fact to see what i did wrong that's what i prefer them for to me they're the reminder or the whole i haven't played the game in a month it's a quick reminder it's put on a video i put it on two times speed i watch through it quick and go yeah yeah okay i remember all this but i have been to game nights where players are arguing like but rodney said this but but uh paul said this but but Marty said this and, and it ends up that you look at the rule and all three were wrong. So it is definitely a thing. But in that case, you do still have the rules there, right? You're still sitting at the store. You can look stuff up. Yep. Now, to help with all this game learning, this is, again, yes, it's a bit of prep ahead of time. But if you can, again, it doesn't take the whole time of having to punch and organize and learn a game. Is have someone in the group take a moment to jump on board Game Geek, check the file section for the game. Fans are awesome at creating rule summaries, one-page rule books, player aids, and things like that that can make it easier for the group to learn a new game. You may even want to put these up on your phone and even just like flip through them and use that at the table if no one did have the time to say print something ahead of time. Just don't read the game reviews. You're just getting the box open. Don't let board game reviewers spoil your first play. Yeah. No, I agree. I try to I try to avoid most reviews before playing games. And I, to be honest, I ignore most other reviewers for anything I'm all that curious about until I play it, because I disagree with a lot of people. Tapestry is a Civ game. Uh, next, I've got the tip no one actually follows. And every time we bring it up, there's usually someone in the chat rooms like, brilliant, yes, we should do that more often. Don't finish the game. Get playing as quick as possible, as noted earlier. Play to find out what happens. Play to learn, not to win. It shouldn't take an entire game to figure out how to play. And once everyone's comfortable, once everyone's got it, everyone knows what's going on, stop. Maybe give the rule book a once over to make sure you weren't playing extreme, because trust me, you probably were. And then restart a new round. Now everyone knows what's going on. This should be a much more enjoyable gaming experience now with everyone getting it, crocking it, and ready to play. Don't fall for getting back to Roger's uh, Psycho, I forget that the, he had a funky term for it. Psychological mechanics, psycho mechanics, psycho player mechanics, whatever you call them, but don't fall for the sunk cost fallacy that you wasted your time unless you finish a game. This is something I find kids are often better at. It's mm-hmm. when we grow older that it becomes more of a problem, especially if you're the one winning the game when yeah. it's time to wrap it up. We all want to win after all because, well, it feels good. That's part of yeah. part of playing games. 
But that's why you have to stress that. That's why I mentioned earlier, you have to stress, look, it's a learning game. We don't care who wins. We're not playing to win. We're trying to make sure everyone understands that it's on the same page. If you're that competitive, don't sit at a table about to break a game open for the first time. Go play something you already can dominate at and kick butt and then come back once these players have learned the game and they can teach you. Finally, I do have a bonus tip. Sometimes it doesn't hurt to have some patience. I know you're all excited about that new game. You're in full-on hype mode. You're at full froth, as the secret cabal would say. And you just need to get that game to the table right now. Maybe take a step back and think for a moment. This is a new game. This is something you're excited about. This is something you want to share with your friends. You want to share it with other people. And you want that experience of playing it for the first time to be as fun as possible. You want that hot new game to live up to the hype. Maybe, maybe, just maybe hold off a week. You put the game aside. You all play something you know. Well, playing, sure, talk about it. Oh, I can't wait to try this. Have you heard this about, oh, did you see the components? Did you see the back of the box? Sure, talk about it. But save actually breaking it open and playing it for the next game night. And then make sure the prep is done for that next event. So again, remember, it doesn't have to be the person who bought the game that does all the work for next week. Well, I understand where the I bought it so I should thoughts come from. But are you the only one who's going to play it, enjoy it as well? Have you never played and enjoyed someone else's games? If you're buying it as a collector's piece, you shouldn't be punching it anyways. If yeah. you're buying it to play, then sharing the fun, and part of that fun is doing all the prep work. And I have to give full credit to um, local gamer Jamie and his friend Clayton. Clayton buys the games and actually gets them shipped to Jamie's house. Then Jamie opens them, plays them, learns how to play, and then Clayton goes to Jamie's to play Clayton's games that he bought. And it works better. for That's what works for them. Clayton's the one with the money. Clayton's the one with the, the um, acquisition disorder that needs a massive collection. And Jamie keeps so many games at his house and Clayton takes other ones home. I, I, I like, first time I heard that, it kind of blew my mind. I was like, well, wait, wait, that doesn't make, why would you do, but, but like, why would he give you his game? And he's like, he just wants to play it. That's why he bought the game. He doesn't care if his shelf looks pretty. I do. So I get to put it on my shelf. Now, before we move on, I do want to just summarize, because that was a, a, bunch of info dump kind of there all at once so just want to reiterate you're all gathered together to play a game and have fun make sure you try to keep the experience fun yes it can be frustrating learning a game for the first time and yes you're probably going to mess things up and you're going to reference the rule book multiple times and that doesn't mean you failed that's what the rule books are for board game rule books are reference material Remember, when actually sitting down to play, it's a learning game and trying to learn to play together. It shouldn't be about who wins and loses, and no one loses anything if you do choose to restart the game once you've all figured it out. This is a learning experience. Relax, have some fun, experiment in the game, do things that seem like the absolute worst terrible strategy just to see what happens. This is your chance to play around. Your next play can be all about figuring out who the champion is and the optimum strategy and maximizing everything. For now, sit back and have fun. Well, that's it for our tips and tricks for opening up a game and getting it to the table played right away. Now let's head over to the lobby and see if they have anything to add. All right, lobbyists, what about you guys? Do you have any thoughts on getting that game right to the table straight without ever opening it before. So I remember there was one on our Discord, which i uh, pretty sure the person who said it is live in the chat and they could repeat, but I am opening that up and now my internet's good enough. We're not going to crash while I do this. Well, I know there were definitely some strong opinions. Some of those strong opinions I was men mentioning earlier yes. came from our chat room. People like and want to be the ones punching their own games. Games, yes. So uh, I don't know if she's in the chat tonight, but Danielle had mentioned who doesn't love punching games. And I'd say there are people who do not. Deanna hates punching games. She's just so worried she's going to rip or tear or punch something wrong or lose a piece. She hates to do it. I'm going back. Here's the chat. I, I have to say, I have no, I couldn't care less who punches a game. I'm one of the ones who wants to read the rule book. Uh, yeah. I really, but, and, and it's weird because I find the physical rule book in front of me with the components in front of me, I can learn mm -hmm. a game no problem. Uh, the videos, while I've been enjoying them, I enjoy them for playing on Board Game Arena where right. I don't have components, where I don't have the physical rule book in front of me. Uh, it's definitely not my preferred way. 
Uh, mm-hmm. I remember what, the last time I was down at your place, you were you were doing some work on Am- uh, on Amazon, sharing deals and stuff. And, and I picked up Aventuria. the Aventuria book and learned how to play Aventuria. <laughs> um, it, it, you know, again, it's not not really that hard a game. Uh, I wish I'd read Space Base instead, but ah, uh, yeah, uh, no, it was uh, you know I, I I like reading rule books. Yeah, so do I. To me, that's the lonely fun. Should do a whole episode on lonely fun at some point. Like I, I love organizing my games. I love spending hours sitting there and putting the right tokens. And it's the problem is I tend to do it before I play. And then I play and go, well, that was dumb. Why did I put these here? But doing the whole, I want, I, I love individual baggy for each player. That is my favorite. If I can get a game to that point where here's everything you need. Here's everything you need. Here's everything you need. Here's everything you need. Here's a bag for what we need to set up. And here's the bag for what we need in the second phase, right? That is my perfect setup. Yeah. So um, Courtney writes, I host convince them they will love it then open the box as soon as we sit down we put on a how to play while we punch and just work through it so yeah that's it's kind of combining a couple of things we said but but you're gonna do that right you like you don't have to stop everyone stop and watch the video do the stuff at the same time uh pax in the chat room is saying uh get the teenagers to do it and uh their teenagers fight over who gets to punch the game nice Uh, so you know farming out the work sometimes is really easy to do depending on your uh your family makeup. Uh, the amusing one with that, that reminds me of Tom Vass. Tom Vass has a lot of kids, so I'm, I don't know which of his daughters does it. He f- hates unboxing videos. He thinks they're dumb. He actually, his series of unboxing videos are called Yet Another Boring Unboxing Video. And what he did is one of his kids loves it. So he farms it out. One of his daughters films all of his unboxing videos because Tom couldn't be bothered. He's like, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. I don't want to punch my games. I don't want to sort my games. I just want to sit down and play. So he does that. So Bike Guy Dave said, I don't want anyone punching my game. Things rip, tear, break, and get thrown away. I want to see myself. I also want to see all of the pieces as I go, which is, I did mention that because that's something for me. Like if it went on, there is definitely something when you're going through a game the first time, touching everything, feeling everything. And then when you read the rules, you're like, oh, that's that counter. Oh, that's those cubes I touched earlier. Yep, absolutely. There's definitely something to be said about the tactile experience of when you read the rule book already knowing what that piece they're referring yes. to looks like feels like or whatever um, and and lesson for mo that i failed on my last unboxing videos is do that before you do an unboxing video so you're not sitting there with tapestry going oh it looks like three little pigs there's like straw huts and and brick buildings and honestly it really does if you haven't played the game so so what i now do is i uh I watch a how to play video before I unbox things when I remember to do so. I was just too excited. I really wanted to get um, some of that stuff to the table. Uh, while we are in the chat room, I do want to thank Board Games and Bourbon and Travic for the follow. Uh, and Ryan is mentioning, of course, this, for this blind meeple, it's all about the tactile experience, yep, which is very, very fair. important. Very fair. And audio versions of rule books, I'm sure. Text readers. So Pax is asking, how do you feel about full sample games? In Wingspan, there's an awesome oh. game that teaches the core mechanics with specific cards and prescribed actions. Wait, those are fantastic for this exact thing. I didn't even think of that because it's not out there that often. Very that nice. that, is, that is great for this particular situation. Set it up, give everyone the sample cards. The, the trick is to do it make sure the players physically do that. Don't just read it. So then he hands them this and he hands them this and then she takes this and then they do this. No, no, do it. Like, like if it says Susie hands a thing to Joe, have Sean hand a thing to Deanna, right? Like yeah. physically do it. Cause I, I, we have entire episodes on teaching games. So I don't want to get into all that here, but some people learn, most people, almost everyone learn best by doing. Some people learn by hearing, some people learn by watching, but almost everyone learns best by doing that. That's just a proven fact and getting people to do the stuff, just reading out the example play isn't probably isn't helping anyone much. Do it, act it out, put it out, pretend you're actors, play through it. Another example of this is Aventuria where you've got the, uh, the sample deck, the, the, the uh, master Taylor's pull demo kit the demo kit where they just take away a lot of the decisions from the players. There's an entire yes. set of decisions that aren't in the game anymore so that you yeah. can focus on the ones that are there. And then when you play when you play later, you've got that one aspect down. So you add in the second aspect. It's such a fantastic mm-hmm. way to teach a game. Again, going back to the video game idea, it's that introducing 
little mechanics or whatever, a little bit at a time yep. uh, throughout plays. And I, I, there's probably good reasons for it, but I also wonder, that's the first time I've gotten as a consumer a demo kit. And it was amazing. Why aren't there more of those out there? Even more so, why aren't you sending those to local game stores? Like, I know you probably want your official demo team to do it because you know they'll do it right, but trust people. Like, people learn to play your games. They'll learn to use your demo kit appropriately. Like, I, if I owned a local game store, I would be contacting all these places. Going, do you have a demo kit for that? Like, anytime, like, hey, we're about to put this up. Do you have a demo kit for that? Because, oh, like, what a better, like, that Master Taylor's Poltergeist was just brilliant the way it slowly taught the rules. And like you said, remove choices, right? Endurance is complicated. Don't worry about it. You get to endurance turn. Don't even worry about that. Just endurance will be there. All right. You got all these different cards to choose from. You know what? Here, your entire deck's in your hand. Here's all five cards. That's your deck. You don't have to worry about what you're going to draw. You don't have to worry about getting the wrong thing. I love it. Um, more games should do it. A game we're going to be reviewing later tonight actually has that. Um, it has a section that kind of walks you through a sample round in order to teach the game. Um, Race for the Galaxy technically has a really good tool for teaching the game, but I never see anyone use it. But the back of the player mats actually have like this walkthrough that you're supposed to walk through people through. And the um, starting world cards are numbered. So you're actually supposed to hand them out to people when you first teach the game. And there are a set of numbered cards where you can play through some sample rounds. Again, almost no one does it. And I get it because it's extra this work is, and it's extra money well it's that but i also get not using them deanna hates being told how to play a game even if it's coming from the game design she would much rather sit there learn to play the game know the rules know the mechanics and interact with them herself and make her own mistakes than be told you're going to do this on your first turn Next time around, you're going to do this. Next time around, you're going to do this and play through a full round. And then now it's you. Go. She hates that. Yeah, Dungeon Lords is another example. The, the Dungeon Lords example is really complicated. What I love about the Dungeon Lords example is halfway through, um, Vlada Shavado says, okay, now that you've done these, ask the players if they're still having fun. And if not, explain to them Dungeon Lords is not a game for them. Because that is a game that you expect to be light and fluffy, and it's one of the heaviest heroes I own. It's a really good game, but ooh, it's a, it's a brain burner, and it's not what you expect from the theme. So yes, I, like have it in there though. Like like have it for the people who do want it. Not everyone's Deanna. Not everyone is like, don't tell me what to do. I want to do it. But I think Deanna did enjoy the Aventuria onboarding, right? Because it wasn't a... Well, that was different. That, that well, didn't tell you it, what it, to yeah, do. It limited your options. Exactly. It's that limiting options, I think, is the better... Yes. Uh, the better of the choices if you're given the opportunity. Yeah. Um, there is something to be said about both... Uh, both methods mm -hmm. uh i i tend to side with deanna here i would prefer just a reduced complexity version of the game mm -hmm. to get going uh and then uh you know ramp up the difficulty once you figure out you're not playing it extreme every time like i think deanna would have hated adventure if it told her which cards to play yeah it said on your first round tap to, sorry don't tap whatever you do i forget <laughs> now use two of your endurance to play this card then roll to attack pretend you rolled the 16 she would have hated that uh, all right. I think that's about all for our uh, lobbyists this week. Sounds good. Remember, if you've got a game or game night question for us, head over to the website and click on Ask the Bellhop. Hello. Today, we're going to be taking a look at Jabuka, a tile-based word game with a twist. Thanks to Jabuka Games for sending us a copy of Jabuka to check out. Now, Jabuka was designed by Martin Rizaki. Uh, and self-published by him in 2019. It plays two to eight players broken up into four teams maximum. Each game takes 15 minutes to half an hour, depending on how much time you spend trying to find words. Now, Jabuka has an MSRP of 1995 and has won a nice handful of toy and educational game awards. Now, for the record, don't look for a deeper meaning in the name of the game. Anything you Google about the word is completely unrelated to the game. There are no apples, Serbian cities, or islands involved. I do have to say, I, why? What, what, like, both Sean and I spent a while trying to figure out what this had to do with coffee. What it has to do with coffee is he came up with the idea in a Starbucks. So that's, that's the secret to, to where the game came from and the coffee theme. So in a game of Jabuka, you spill the letter beans on the table and players rush to spell words. 
The neat bit here is that the game uses a special set of letters and letter pairs that can be used multiple ways. For example, the U tile turned the right way could be a C and turned another way could be a small N. Now, along with spelling your own words, players can also steal words from other players by rearranging the letters, adding letters to the opponent's words, or rotating the letters. To get a look at the coffee-themed components in this game, check out our Jabuka unboxing video on YouTube. So the game comes in a small sack-like bag, like, a, you know, a coffee bean bag with a cardboard tag on it. You can tell that's meant to be on store shelves like that. Now, inside, you will find a set of two-sided fold-out instructions and, of course, all the letter tiles. Now, these tiles are made of recycled wood and are shaped like coffee beans. Now, the letters are only on one side of the beans, and the special twistable letters are in yellow, with the rest of the letters being in white. In addition, the game includes eight lighter colored coffee beans that are used as wild cards that have no letters on them. Now, it is worth noting that many of my tiles were stuck together when I opened this up. Now, these weren't difficult to separate, and once separated, I didn't notice any damage to the stuck tiles, but this isn't something my kids wouldn't have been able to do. Like, it did take some strength to kind of snap them apart. There are many factors that could cause the sticking, including recent heat waves, but the designer is reaching out to their manufacturer about the issue we found. So you start a game of Jabuka with the poor. You take the sack and dump the coffee bean-shaped tiles out all over the table. Now, no, you don't flip any of the tiles over, but you do make sure they're all laying flat so the players can see the face-up letters. Now, the players break into four teams, up to four teams, sorry. Each team takes two of the light-colored tiles with no letters on them as wild cards. So you say four teams, but this game plays two to eight players. Yes. Uh, is there any variant rules for two to three players or? Nope. No, with two to, with two players, you're each on your own team. With three players, you're each on your own team or two players could pair up against the other. It, it's just the, the max though is four teams. Now, what happens though with your teams is that it dictates whose words you're going to add together. So if you and I are a team, you're going to grab your own words and put them in front of you. But at the end of the game, we're going to get points for both of ours. And it matters for stealing, which we'll get to in a minute. Now, letters are on the table. Everyone's going to look and try to find words, right? When you spot a word, you're going to say it out loud. This is an important rule of the game. And then grab the individual beans that make up that word and place the completed word in front of you. Note that if two players say the same word, the player who grabs the beans first gets the word. Also, if someone grabs a bean for your word before you can finish spelling it in front of you, you have to put the letters back and find a new word. Now, with this, this isn't meant to be a game of spoons. There's no wrestling around. There's no fighting over beans. The first person to touch the bean gets it. No jostling each other or anything like that. I, I just feel like with some groups, this game sounds like it could use a referee. Mm -hmm. Uh, that wasn't a problem in our games, but we were playing with our kids and it didn't get too uh, too hot and heated. But yeah, I could definitely see a couple people like trying to, oh, or try to try to steal it. Now, a neat part of this is someone can, if they hear you say a word, try to find a word that uses the other letters and say it quickly to be able to grab theirs. But note, there is that time of having to say the word. So usually you can grab your letters pretty quickly. Now, in addition to spelling your own words, players can also steal words from the opponent's teams. And this is done in one of three ways. Rearrange a word. Move the letters in the word around to make a new word. Add letters of a word to make a new word. Uh, this could be at the end, in the middle, and you can add as many letters as you want. Or rotating the special Jabuka letters to form a new word. Because again, you have a bunch of multi-use letters that can be used at least two different ways on all of them. And you can combine all of these. So you could add a new letter and rotate a letter and rearrange things to steal a word. Now, while a word can get stolen multiple times, you can't reuse an earlier form of that word to steal it back. So you can't be like, well, I put war and I put um, and I changed it to raw. And then you're like, well, I'm going to change raw to war. Well, no, I'm going to change war to raw. You can't do that. You can't reuse the same word with the same letters. So not only do you have to manage grabbing the right tiles for the words you've said, who touches what in what order, and you have to track, at least keep in mind, what words have been used so mm -hmm. that no one can go back to an earlier one that has already been used with a grouping. Yeah, there is definitely a memory element to this game. Even when you're looking on Board Game Geek, one of the mechanics listed for this is memory. Similar, like like if, if a player forgets the previous form on your, of a word you had, the opponent's welcome to steal it back. That is totally a legal move. Okay, so you can... You, you can cheat as per se if, if in, in a no way one, yeah as long as no one catches you 
as long as no one catches you and that's important there is actually a section of the rules about how quick right like how by the time you're spelling your next word you can't back up is one of the rules now remember the beginning you poured the beans well some of them are going to end up face down so at some point players are going to start having a hard time finding words at any point any player playing can say flip everyone agrees you flip the tiles now there's a strategy here where a player could be like hell no i still see four more words i'm not flipping anything you go flip yourself and i'm going to keep building stuff but once everyone does agree each team flips two more tiles and then they make words and you keep going you keep doing this until the final flip when the last beans become face up the first player after that that makes a word says jabuka and as soon as they finish the cut the game stops wherever you are if you're halfway through playing a word you got to put it back teams then out how many beans they have literally count the pieces team with the most pieces wins the game all right, well, now that you've given us an overview of play, what did you think of Jabuka? So when I was first contacted by Martin, the designer of Jabuka, on Instagram, it took a quick look at the webpage. And I was like, I need this. I got to get this game. I have to check this out. And I was so excited to test this because of the way it uses letters for other letters by twisting them. This is something my kids have been doing for the last few years on our fridge. Like over the years, and I think every parent has this exact same thing happen, we've collected a number of letter and number magnets from various toys, and none of those sets are complete anymore. Due to this, we're missing a number of letters and numbers, and we don't have enough of certain numbers and so on. And Deanna and I have both been blown away by our kids' creativity in using the letters we do have to spell things out. And that's what got me excited about Jabuka. Indeed, the concept really caught my eye when you shared it to me as well. I think many, many families have this same shared fridge letters experience. I'm going to have to do that. I'm going to have to like go on Twitter and see if I can start a, a viral post on who else does this type of thing. Now, when I first dumped out the beans, I was really excited. I want to see what they'd done, right? I want to see this. I, I, I loved the look, weight, and texture of the beans. Like they feel very light, like coffee beans, you expect to be kind of heavy. They're not. If you've ever had roasted coffee beans, they're like very, and they make a really good sound when dumping in. They're like, just the clatter is fantastic. We should note that these are recycled wood. Yes. Uh, so this big game has a very low carbon footprint. Again, because they're not, this is, there's no box. It's just a bag. Yep. Now, what I wasn't expecting is that you don't get to do it yourself. It's not up to the players to figure out what words or letters are twistable. The twistable letters are in a different color. And along with this, each letter can only be used to make specific other letters. Like there's a chart in the rule book to show all the legal letter swaps. This kind of surprised me. I expected this to be more freeform. I expected you to be able to make whatever you want out of any or all the letters. Like with this, my entire family, because we've been playing the fridge game for the last few years, felt there were some omissions. Like, where's the capital I that could also be a small L? Or where's the Z you turn on its side to be an N? Or why can't I flip a V over as an A? So somewhat less flexible than your average eight-year-old with magnet letters on the page. Yes. Now, the other surprise for me was the fact there are two letter combinations. Now, Sean also checked out the web page. I'm wondering if you noticed it. But, like, I had no clue those were in there. Like, I thought this was really cool. Like, this is something I can't do on my French magnets. I don't have the the, the two-letter stuff, which uh, one's NG, and when you flip it, it's, uh, I now I forget, UD or whatever. I don't know. They all work. I'm forgetting off the top of my head. Like, I actually went back today and went back to their webpage, and in one picture, they show one. But it's definitely not something they highlighted. And I appreciate this. This is cool. I like this aspect. That was something that, that wasn't really highlighted in the marketing material. So that's a bonus. Yeah, and while there are some things missing that we wish were there, this is a nice addition yeah. that we weren't expecting. Exactly. Now, I'll admit, I called the designer out. I'm like, I showed him pictures of my fridge and the stuff I, my kids have done, like sevens as T's using lead speech and um, X's as K's when put next to another letter. And they've come up with some really creative stuff. And I said, why didn't you use some of the obvious swaps, right? And the designer wrote back and said, the main thing is it's meant to be a party game. This is supposed to be quick and easy to teach. And by saying the yellow ones are special, don't worry about the others, makes a, your decision uh, tree smaller. You don't have to worry about the white letters. You can't flip those. You only have to worry about the yellow ones. And then he also wanted it to be very clear what letters could be used as wart to avoid arguments. So you don't have someone new coming in and going, well, that's not a, that doesn't actually look like an X. That's a T. Like, the, the thing's obviously smaller. There's no way that's an X, right? You want to avoid those arguments. And I guess I get it. 
Yeah, I everyone's idea of a party is different, I guess. <laughs> so, well, not quite what I expected. Uh, the the Jabuka letter set does work. Like it works while you're playing. Um, it really does require some creative thinking in order to build words with the set and even more imagination to use ways to use these twisty letters and pairs to steal words. And that stealing word aspect is something else that it, I, I don't know about unique completely, but it's definitely unusual for letter tile games, tile letter games, right? Like I honestly have not played and can't think of any other game that lets you steal opponents words by modifying them. Yes, there's building on other words in Scrabble and building on top of words and upwards, but like you don't take the word. It doesn't become yours. You're just building on a central tableau. I've never seen it in a game where every player has their own collection of completed words that can be stolen. And then there's that whole rush to grab the letters mechanic, right? What these two combined do is make for a very cutthroat game. And that means this is not going to be for everyone, even word game fans. Indeed, as we pointed out, I'm not the biggest fan of the real cutthroat games. And I have to say, as a result, this one isn't sitting with me quite as well as I'd hoped when mm -hmm. I first saw the concepts and the images and the, the press material. Now, as for me and my family, we have only played this with the immediate family. Uh, my wife, Deanna, and our two girls, we dig it. This is a neat word game. Uh, it does some things different from other similar games on the market. Now, I admit, uh, we may be a bit biased because of the Fridge Magnet game, and this reminds me of that. So we already liked that playing with letters. That system works really well. It, it does a good job of recreating the Fridge Magnet game. And I really dig the letter pairs because I didn't expect that at all. That blew me away. And the ways you can twist these to make multiple different letters. Um, the designer has pointed out with war, you can actually make nine different words with the tiles for war because of how you can rotate them, flip them, and rearrange them, which I think is really cool. Um, what I do wish is there was a bit more variety. I do understand keeping things simple to make the game mass market available. My biggest concern with this game, though, is that real-time competitive nature of the game. While some families are going to be up for fast, furious fun with players trying to grab letters before the other players and stealing each other's words and screwing each other over, other families are going to prefer a less confrontational style of word game. Now, I will say... This is not in the rule book. This is breaking the rules. This is house ruling. There's nothing stopping you for playing this as a more turn-based game, removing the take that aspects. Like players take turns making a word. You make a word, you look, you make your word, try to make as big as possible. Then you make a word, then you make a word, and we all decide when to flip. That would work perfectly fine. Remove the ability to steal words. I think the game would still work. But again, that is not how the game is written or how it's designed to be played. I, one concern I have and why I think I wouldn't play this with my family is that I feel like my youngest child might be hesitant about their word knowledge, mm -hmm. word, word knowledge, especially against mom and dad, enough to hold them back and really lose out as a result of that right. hesitancy. Because it sounds like you really need to dive in without fear to get the most out of this game. Well... Uh, that's definitely been true in our games, right? So so one of my kids is an avid reader, A student, really impressive vocabulary, and she loved the game. She thought it was fantastic. She kicks my butt every time we play against each other. And I still haven't gotten her to sit down. I was hoping to get it today to have a mother-daughter game because Deanna's the big word game fan out of the two of us. Now, my other daughter, who does like to read, does struggle with spelling grammar. And due to that, did not like this game at all. Um, she honestly kind of had a meltdown the first time playing. She particularly hated the fact that she would work really hard to build a word, even something small like pig, and then someone else could steal her hard one word. And, and it took her so much effort to even make that one word that that was devastating for her to have stuff stolen. All right, well, to wrap things up, if you dig word games, I do recommend giving Jabuka a try. It's definitely not just another word tile game. It's not just another Bananagrams. It's not just another Scrabble tiles. It's not another, I can't even remember what the Apple one's called, the Cubs and an Apple. This is something different. It adds an additional twist, pun intended, in both the multi-use tiles and the ability to steal words from the opposing team. If you're not a word game fan, you probably aren't even listening anymore and have already hit skip and went to the next section. Uh, if you have, stuck around i'm sorry to say i don't think jabuka is going to win you over like maybe if you just like really cutthroat games where you can stab your opponents in the back and like stealing things from your opponents to win you might enjoy that 
Now, what I will say, if you own a coffee shop, you should be reaching out to these people, possibly for a sponsorship and just get some copies in your store. Sell it. Like the coffee bean theme here is perfect. Plus, it's just something cool to have out on the tables for patrons to play with. As something sitting out on the table, I can absolutely see people really taking advantage of this, making up their own games and just having fun with words and the rotatable letters, even if you never learn mm -hmm. or even know that it's a bigger game than that. Yeah, exactly. Like, because in addition to being an interesting word game, I think the tiles here are just cool. Like, they're cool to have. They remind me of Not Dice, which we reviewed quite a ways back here, where you could just dump them out on a coffee table, have them on an end table for guests to fiddle with. Also, these are a really great learning tool for teachers and parents, for getting kids to think outside the box with letters and playing around with letters. Ignore the game. Just use the components for a teaching tool. Well, that's it for our look at Jabuka. I invite you to read more about Jabuka in the review section of the blog over at tabletopbellhop.com. Welcome to a look at Trap Words, a word-based party game with a dungeon-crawling theme. A big thank you to CGE for sending us a review copy of Trap Words to check out. Trap Words was designed by a team, including Jan Bresnia, Brezina, sorry, Jan Brezina, Martin Harbalek and Michael Poserek. It features artwork by David Jablonski, Philip Mermack, Regis Torres, and Michaela Zaraova. It was originally released in 2018 and published in North America by Czech Games Edition, aka CGE. This word game plays four to eight players, and potentially more, with each game taking under an hour. This is a family weight game with a listed age of eight plus. Now, the MSRP on Trap Words is a nice low $19.95. A great price for a game that plays with big groups. Always nice to see really accessible party games at this price point. Also, as a note, there was another game now long out of print called Trap Words back in the 90s mm -hmm. from Mind Games International. And this is not that game, nor is it really in any way similar. So this version of Trap Words is a dungeon crawl themed team based word guessing game where teams are trying to advance deeper into the dungeon by guessing words without the torchbearer, aka the clue giver, mentioning any of the trap words which have been chosen ahead of time by the other team. As you get deeper into the dungeon, you may have to deal with curses. Your opponents will get to use more and more trap words. Now the goal of the game is to be the first team to defeat the boss monster. To see what you get in a copy of this unique dungeon crawler, check out our Trap Words unboxing video on YouTube. So Trap Words comes in a small board game box, pretty much a standard small box size that a lot of companies use. Thank you for that. That contains way more stuff than you think you would need for a word-based party game. There's baggies, stands and standees, pencils, sharpeners, um, a clear, easy to understand 12 page rule book, a four page example of play, which is great for teaching the concept of this game. Punch boards with torches, monsters and dungeon rooms, cool looking book like clue holders, and then a ton of cards, including boss monster cards, clue cards, and a hefty set of word cards. There's also a nice thick pad of trap sheets, which can also be downloaded from CG's website if you do ever happen to run out. Everything here is top-notch quality. Uh, the cardboard was literally falling off the punch boards when I was unboxing the video, and I love the design of the foldable clue books. My only real complaint is that the standees for both adventuring parties both use the same artwork but are in different colors, which I gotta say is really a very minor quibble. So what are we doing with all this stuff? How do you play trap words? So you start to build a dungeon to explore, which is a set of rooms going left to right. A typical dungeon has five rooms that are numbered three, four, five, six, seven. Now the game does include additional tiles, giving you the numbers from one all the way up to 10. This lets you modify the difficulty of the game as these numbers represent how many trap words each team can pick. Both teams start in the first lowest numbered room. Players then select a monster to fight against. Put its card on the table and place the appropriate monster standing in the last room at the opposite end of the dungeon. Curses are then added to the dungeon if you choose to use them. These are randomly drawn and in a standard game placed in rooms five and six. Now it's recommended you don't use these at all in a teaching game and you always have the option to add more to more rooms if you want to make the game harder. It's always nice to see a game that has easy to use and understand mechanics like this that allows mm -hmm. you to customize your game's difficulty. 
Yeah, the dials on this game are fantastic. More games should come with this many var- this much variability for difficulty setup. Now, players are split into two teams in whatever way they want. Now, each team must have at least two players. This game does not work with fewer than four players at all. It's just unplayable. It's not a case of it doesn't quite work or it feels bad. No, like you cannot play this game without at least four players. Now, one player on each team is going to be assigned to be the torch bearer and takes the torch token to indicate this. This is the player that's going to be giving the clues during this round. So please note, real torches are not recommended accessories, no matter how much you like to theme up and upgrade your game nights. Well, I got to admit, it kind of wants to get some kind of like cosplay LED one that you have to hold as the as the clue giver. And like, that's a rule that you must be holding the torch while giving the rules. That would definitely help tie in the theme a little more. I'm, I'd be totally for that. Now, the next thing you do is I mentioned these like book like clue holders. They're hard to describe without images. I'm sorry. Um, the You pick which ones to use. So there's one set that's mundane and one set that's fantasy. One's going to reveal fantasy themes on the cards when you put them in, like troll, myth, and axe. The other set features more common words like elephant, submarine, and yo-yo. And those are all actual words from the game. So is yo-yo a common word anymore? I feel like nobody talks about yo-yos anymore. You know what? They did have a recent resurgence with the popularity of video apps like TikTok. And there were all kinds of people doing tricks with yo-yos. And there was that brief period where my kids each wanted a yo-yo. But that was a few years back. So I think it might have faded again. It's interesting. Every once in a while, yo-yos emerge from the depths and become super popular. And everyone wants a yo-yo. And everyone wants to learn how to walk the dog and, you know, uh, rock the baby. Rock the cradle. cradle. But then it disappears as as mysteriously yes. as it emerges the yo-yos are a magic thing they, it's kind of like they yo-yo in and out of popularity so each team then draws a word card and puts it in your book and looks at it so i say you pick which books put a clue card in it you make sure you draw face down and put it down so you can't see any of their words so on this is the word that the opposing team will be trying to guess this isn't for your team what you're going to do then is grab the the, the sheet the the trap word sheet and your team is going to write down a number of words that will be traps. Now the rules contain extensive rules on what makes for a legal trap. And honestly, I'm not going to get into the details of it here. You're going to have to actually pick up the game and read the rules to figure that out. So needless to say, you're trying to come up with words likely to be said without removing any hope of them being able to offer clues. Although, no, 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 you want to offer them no hope if you can. Like, if you can do it and get it so they can't say, there's, there's no semi-co-op here. You're not working together. You're not trying to leave an opening. No, you're trying to set up a solid defense. If you can come up with the right trap word so the opponents are completely stumped, all the power to you. Well, I, I assumed there were some rules that allowed you to, you know, that allowed some wiggle nope. room. Okay. No, no wiggle room. If you can come up with the proper words, it, it makes it very interesting. Now, once both teams have chosen their traps, the books are passed to the torchbearer on the other team, and the guessing begins. Now, the team that's furthest behind in the dungeon goes first, and in the case of a tie, one book out of every set is uh, lit up. I don't know how they, it's glowing uh, based on the artwork to indicate which team goes first in the tie. Now, in a guessing round, the sand timer is started, and the torchbearer begins to give clues to their team. Similar to valid trap words, there are also a set of restrictions that makes for valid clues, and again, I'll leave that for you to discover now the torchbearer's teammates are listening to these clues and get a total of five guesses as to what word the clue giver is trying to get them to say now the clue giver can say as much as they want they can babble on forever if they want to at least until the timer runs out but they have to watch out that they don't use any of the other team's trap words if they say any of these words, the round ends immediately. The other team tends to jump from joy, slap, or be happier, or yell trap very exuberantly, and the team fails to advance in the dungeon. Note, the trap words only affect the torchbearer mm-hmm. who is giving the clues, not the other players on the team who are doing the guessing. This is important. Now, if the torchbearer's team does not manage to guess the word before the timer runs out, or if they've used their five guesses and the guesses have run out, their I'm sorry does manage torchbearer's team does manage to guess the word before the timer runs out before they run the clues they're going to advance to the next room of the dungeon the other team then plays through their own round with exactly the same rules now if neither team advances the boss monster advances towards the teams 
So either way, you're getting closer to an end. Mm -hmm. And you don't need to worry about getting stuck in the first dungeon forever without being able to finish. Just playing on because nobody can get anything right. That is correct. Now, along with this, some rooms will have curses. This is the catch-up mechanic in this game. The first team to enter a room with a curse will be affected by it. And they're going to have to apply whatever it says on the curse card in their next guessing round. Now, these include all kinds of things like getting to use fewer traps, having to repeat clues, only using one word for clues, and so on. They can modify both the clues given and the guessing and the traps. And again, this is a flexible aspect of the game that you can use to ramp up or down the difficulty. Yeah, you don't have to use any traps. You can put down multiple traps. It's, or Sorry, curses, not traps, curses, multiple curses. Totally up to you. Now, when any team starts in the room with the boss monster, they enter the boss fight phase. Each boss monster includes some form of restrictions, making it harder than usual for the team to win the round. Uh, these include limiting the number of guesses. Um, one of the monsters, I can't remember which one of it, reduces three guesses, and the difficult version of that monster reduces it to only one. Uh, the mummy I love because you have to hand out a random curse every round. There's other ones that limit what the torchbearer can say. Like, they can only give one word clues. Now, the first team to actually win against a boss fight wins the game. Now, there is another timer. So if you are stuck in that first room, instead of just fighting the boss monster over and over again, the uh, score sheet, like the, sorry, the clue sheet, the trap word sheet, the sheet you're writing your trap words on, has eight spots on it. And if all eight rounds go by with no one defeating the boss monster, you both lose. The adventurers were lost in the dungeon, eaten, defeated by the boss monster. Now that you've given us an overview of how to play, how about you share your thoughts on this fantasy-themed party game? So I have been wanting to try this game for a long time now. Um, due to requiring exactly four players or more to play, and with Ontario just starting to loosen up on pandemic time gathering restrictions, we weren't able to get this to the table until very recently. Now that we have gotten into the table and played it with mixed groups, we played four to six players, including a mix of adults and kids. I'm quite smitten with this, especially once we started playing with the proper rules. So during the first couple of rounds we played in this game, we totally missed the rule that traps are only triggered by the torchbearer, the clue giver, not the people guessing, not by their teammates. Now the game worked with anyone setting up traps. And to be honest, one of the boss monsters makes that an official rule for that round as anyone can set off traps. What was happening, though, was just traps went off every round. Like, like almost no one advanced. I think we got to room three in the dungeon before the monster finally came to us and someone did win. Like, traps were going off left and right, and there was no progression. Like, it was playable, but it wasn't fun. You didn't get the joy of winning a round. It was just get beat up, lose, lose, lose. And playing with the proper rules fixes this completely. So this is a big warning to anyone out there playing this game now or picking it up. Don't make the same mistake Mo did. No. Only the clue givers can set off traps. Only the torch bearers trigger traps. Yes. Think of the theme of the game. They're in the front of the party. They're the ones that set off the traps. And I guess you don't have a thief with you in this game. Now, playing properly, the game was just as much fun with four people as it was with five and with six. Now, we did not get to the higher player counts. Now, the box says eight plus, so you could play with eight players. If they're thinking four per team, but this is also like a game of code names. Technically, it happens to be the same publisher where really there's no limit to the number of players you can have on teams. You can play with any number. Now, the problem, though, is working together, in particular during the trap phase, because when you have fire player counts, how do you work together? Like, you could whisper to each other. The big thing is you don't want the opposing team to hear any of this. There's also the problem of having too many guessers because you only get five guesses and a guess said by anyone counts with too many peoples on a team. You're just going to burn through those guesses really quickly because by the book, you can't consult with the other players while guessing. So uh, watch out for that person who yells random words, words out during party games, hoping for a hit battleship style. Yes, this is not the game where you just shout out Elvis at the beginning of every round just because you know that's one of the clues because you played before. Now, when we play, what we do so to, to remove the, the talking to each other and the whispering is we just pass the sheet around. And what we do is everyone writes down two, assuming they can think of at least two. So they write down two, write down two, you write down two. And even if you only allowed three traps, we then all look at those and pick three of the ones we want to keep. 
or we write down four each or whatever. And we'll go back and forth like, oh, I got a good one. Like that's all they'll say is, oh, I got a good one, right? You're not giving anything away. And this works good with small groups, but like if I had eight people on my side, I can't see passing, we're well, gonna pass this paper to eight different people. Now, maybe if you could physically separate the two teams, possibly in different rooms, then higher player pounds would work because then you can discuss it. Yeah, definitely important to get some separation in there if you want to have any sort of hope of talking, even yeah. if you've just moved to opposite sides of your FLGS and there's enough other games going on that, you know, you can uh, hide your talk amongst the noise. Now, what I love the most about this game is the thought process you go to in both main phases of the game. So like the first few games you play, at least with us, the, the trap writing phase, we were just thinking of words that fit the clue, right? It said axe, and we're like, um, wood, chop, um, tin man, um, you know, and we're just thinking of ourselves. Then one game, we noticed there's a meta game here we completely missed. Realizing who's going to be giving the clues is a big part of deciding which words should be your trap words, not and who's going to be giving the, the guessing as well, but more so the clue giver. Like our daughter is probably not going to think of melee weapon for axe, whereas she may think sharper hit. Right. So you're not going to expect your 12 year old to come up with the same clues as a 45 year old gamer. <laughs> yes, exactly. And same with the guessing, right? To twist it around too is you have to watch who's guessing that the, the eight-year-old is going to have a different view of the world than an older person. Then the other part of this game, the guessing phase, I love being the clue giver and trying not to say words my opponents have written down and coming up with roundabout ways to describe things in order to get players to say something. Now, the interesting part here too, though, is after now playing the game multiple times, um, with some of the same players, my approach has shifted too. And a part of that would be knowing who's going to be picking the trap words, which is the same as the opposite side, right? Like I know Deanna is probably going to write this down and I know that the Genevieve is going to write this down. And then there's, the, I played now a bunch of games with Deanna. So now there's the whole Vizini death scene from Princess Bride, right? Where I'm like, well, I can't say that because they probably wrote down that. So it's so obvious. But wait, if they knew I knew it was so obvious, they probably wrote it down. Or maybe, uh, oh, I'm going to avoid that word. But then what if they knew that I'd probably avoid that word? So they, that whole thing. Aha, you fool. You fell victim to one of the classic blunders, the most famous of which is never get involved in a land war in Asia, but only slightly well less, less well known is this. Never go against a Sicilian when death is on the line. Ha 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 ha. Now, overall, I've been shocked by how much we've actually been enjoying trap words. Uh, the most shocking part is actually how much my daughters love it, uh, including the one who normally has difficulty with words, grammar, and spelling. I think being able to be on a team has really opened her up to the game. And I love her unique way of looking at the world. Having her be the team giver, or sorry, the, the clue giver, the torch bearer, is fascinating just to see the way her brain works compared to the rest of us. I think that is fantastic. Yeah, it's amazing how just a little bit of support like that can give confidence enough to really change things around for some people. Now, if I did have to complain about something, uh, the only thing I can really mention is just that this game is so different from other party games. The way this game's work is rather unique and different from most guessing games. And it takes a while from some people for some people to get it. Like, I've honestly experienced this. And it's not like I'm teaching brand new players who've never played a hobby game before like I'm, I'm talking about experienced players who played many games and i think the designers realize this because they included a short example of play meant to be a way to teach the game which i do think helps though i honestly think the best way is just dive in and start playing like if you have a couple people who know the game have them be the first clue givers because they know how it works. That way they can walk the teams through their trap phase because they played before and then give an actual example of legal clues and how they work and then drop some of the stuff, right? Like don't worry about the five clue limit the first round or something like that just to get used to it. And then when you have that one person who does blurt out four things in a row, go, remember, you only get five guesses. Don't just blurt things out. I also suggest you take advantage of the additional dungeon tiles. Like I find it odd. They don't give you like a simple setup where the rooms are like one, two, three, four. 
and you just play through or even one two three you got one clue two clues three clues ditch the things and maybe not even have a boss monster just the first person to advance to room four wins use this stuff use the other stuff in the box to make it simple the other thing you can do too is you don't have to start in the same room and i think a fun way to play versus the kids is to start the dungeon at level one and put the kids in there but then put a level eight or ten before it and the the parents need to get out of the the oubliette before they actually get to explore the dungeon i think that'd be a cool way to do it i actually really dig the amount of variability that's here because of the curse tiles uh all the monsters there's two levels presented so you can randomize them or you can just start with a higher level you could also do the thing where the parents have to fight the tough dragon and the kids fight the easy dragon fair warning though those curses can be rough so you may want you may be tempted to splatter them everywhere you might want to back up on that it's really impressive how flexible and variable the difficulty level of this game is because i'm sure you could also just shuffle through your curse deck pull out the really nasty ones and only play with ones that are of an easier level totally fair and there are some nasty clues one of them is echo you have to repeat every word you say and you're the clue giver and this is not a game where you say cup you say vessel for transporting water to be ingested because you are worried they wrote cup and mug and drink and whatever right. coffee right that's what so like you're not trying to give one so instead you're like vessel vessel for for and so on i'm not going to get into it that was a horrible one we dealt with and and props to my mother-in-law for managing to pull it off so someone in our chat room has always caught this but trap words takes the basic concept of games like taboo but puts the control in the player's hands and more interestingly, the opponent's hands. This is an extremely solid and fun word guessing game with a unique theme. If you dig word guessing games, I would hope at this point, you've already got a copy in your cart or you've already sent a text message to your local game store to hold you a copy. This is especially true if you dig the dungeon crawl theme. Now, if you're not normally a word guessing fan, you still might want to check this out. This is so unique and does things in such a different way. It may just win you over. Yeah, I don't think we can understate the difference of picking your own trap words versus a game like Taboo, where there's a fixed Mm -hmm. list of words you can't say that were designed by the designer of the game. Yes. And added to that, the, the replayability is infinite here as opposed to a game where you could eventually play through all the cards and have memorized the answers. I personally, at this point, I expect this game to get a lot of play. Like we're already playing it quite a bit just with like uh, local people coming over and going to, going to the in-laws and and playing there. But like, Oh, once, once we get out into public cons, Epic game, like like, this is a perfect extra life gaming marathon game, like a, a fantastic game for those type of events. Now, before we do sign off, tonight i do want to add a footnote while reviewing this game i personally couldn't help but compare it to letter jam and i'm not saying they should be compared they're kind of apples to oranges but it's the fact that both of these games are from the same company they're both word games they're both kind of sold as party games and while i got them both on the same day (laughs) so of the two games i think each is great but in their own way and where i think both perfectly fit in my collection is for two totally different game nights If I'm about to go down with my small group of friends that I get together with on a regularly on a weeknight and I'm going to sit and we, we play games, we tend to play heavier Euro games that I'm, I'm going to grab letter jam. It's a, it's a heavier game with a lot more thinking. There's deduction required. Plus it's also cooperative and also only requires two players. So this is something Deanna and I can play just the two of us on a date night, or we can play with one of the kids instead of both of them being required. All right. So I'm going to a public play game night party. Adult beverages, we're here to have fun. I'm going to grab Trap Words. It's a lighter, more fun, well, not more fun. It, it, it's a different type of fun. It's a fun, laughing, competitive party game that gets everyone interacting and laughing with each other and, you know, getting mad at each other in that gameplay mad. Like, oh, I can't believe you said this or why didn't you say that? The kind of stuff you get from party games. Personally, I am very happy to have both in my collection. So thank you, CGE. Both these games are going to keep hitting my table as time goes on. Well, that's it for our look at Trap Words from CGE. I invite you to read more about this game in the review section over at the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. 
And now the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. He hosted a game night with friends in our house. We had Euro Pizza and Halibut Bites and played a bunch of games. I was so jealous of those pitchers. Tori and Kat, Kat are such great people and yeah. patrons, but also just great people. And it's so nice to see them back playing with you guys again. Yes. And they're so photogenic. I love taking pictures of them compared to Ian and I, Darren looking angry all the time. We, we definitely uh, we're, we're kind of opposites that way <laughs> compared to them. So the, I'm, I'm going to start with that. There's going to be some other games we did play. We did have another game night. Um, as well, getting together with the the uh, extended family too. So we got lots to cover this week. Uh, first was Riff Rap. So this is Tori and Cat. This wasn't on the plan. Like we had a list of we're going to play these. Some was obligation. Some stuff we just wanted to show off. And Deanna is not a dexterity fan. Yes, she did have fun playing it with me once, but playing with other people around, she'll get too nervous. She didn't want to. So after eating dinner, though, Deanna had something she had to do with my mom. So. While she was gone, I'm like, oh, I'm going to break out Riff Raff. So I kind of grabbed Riff Raff, put it together, and I showed it off to Tori and Kat. I knew Tori was going to dig this game, and man, was I so right. He loved it. Uh, he was so, excuse me, he was rather good at it. Uh, Kat, though, except at the very beginning of the game, was the master stacker. She was putting stuff up on the nines and tens without it falling, but she was not good at the catching thing. And that's the part that, to me, sets Riff Raff apart from all these other balancing games. Yes, a part of the game is getting your stuff to balance on the ship, but a bigger part is catching stuff when it goes wrong. That is a huge part of this game that I've never seen in any other game that's actually slowly pushing out. The more I play, the more this is like approaching hamster roll level. I don't think it's going to beat hamster roll ever, but it's slowly overstepping a bunch of other dexterity games just for that element. This was the game when I was playing, I managed to catch five things with one hand during this game. I was so proud of myself. Everything started tipping and I managed to catch it all on my other hand though, my left hand, the left and right working at once didn't work and everything kind of fell that way. This is a fantastic game. Uh, they loved it sadly out of print that's the only problem that tori and cat had with this game is they can't get themselves a copy i have to say this game photographs great as the yeah. expressions of people as they fight to get a plank or a little mouse to balance on a wobbling piece in front of them are just priceless yes i i, I took a couple videos too i haven't done anything with those yet so i'm hoping i might get some of those up on with uh, uh, what instagram reels or tiktok someday i'll actually i'll crack the tiktok code and know exactly what i'm doing so after that, Deanna joined us, right? She kind of like put the silly dexterity game away. No, she had actually had fun watching us play. Next, we broke out Unfair. Now, normally, we, we discussed this ahead of time. Normally, if I was going to introduce Unfair to someone, I would start with Funfair. Yes, those are two different games. One has an F in front of it. Funfair is technically the newer game, but to me, it's, it's like, a, it's like the, um, the prequel. It's, it's you should play it first. And if we had had time... Because we didn't know. This could have been a one-time thing, and we'd all walk down again for another six months. So we didn't know how much time we are going to get to play with, with Tori and Kat. So I'm like, you know what? We're going to step it up. We're going to go right to Unfair. We, If we didn't have other games we also wanted to play, uh, we probably would have done Funfair first. But no, we dove in. Now, again, Tori and Kat are experienced game players. I've taught them many games. They, we, have a, a, we play a lot of games with each other, so we know how to explain things. So it worked, right? For the rest of you, I do still suggest start with Funfair. So we set up a four-player game, um, didn't use any game changers for people who know the game. We just played straight up. Uh, we let everyone pick their own decks. We ended up with the Vampire, Ninja, Gangsters, and Jungle decks. Now, one of the reasons we're reviewing this is we still hadn't tried all these decks, and they were kind of shocked that I had stuff in Shrink, but this is another pandemic issue. I couldn't, we played it two players, and it, it, it's okay, two players, but it's better with more. We played it when Sean was down, but like, I just haven't had a time to really dive into all the different things to explore in this, because the game plays better with more people. So this was our first time seeing all of those decks except the Vampire. So I will share my thoughts on what I think on each so far. So Ninja. Totally not what I expected. I don't know what I expected. I, I, I don't know. Ninjas, I hidden cards, ninja themed things. I don't know. But what it was really about was take that sneak attacks and backstabbing, which I guess fits. But man, uh, previously we had thought Vampire was a little nasty. Nothing compared to Ninja. Now, Gangster, I really like. There is some really neat stuff in Gangster. I, it's very low key compared to the others. Like, uh, they're not a lot of roller coasters in that uh there there's a lot of tongue-in-cheek things like you know calling in the the garbage company and uh the ability to print your own money that is actually the one of their showcase rides is they can print money 
And what it is, is you get 25 bucks a turn and you lose it all at the end of the turn. So you spend as much of it as you can and you get away with it. That was neat. Uh, but the thing that's weird about this one is it adds in a brand new attraction type, the hotel. And with that, there are a bunch of new upgrades that only work on hotels. And of course, there's blueprints based on having various hotels with different upgrades. This is neat and it worked, but with four players and four decks in play, the cards just didn't come up frequently enough. I honestly think the strength of that deck is going to vary by the number of players playing. I really want to try now two player with the gangster. I think it'd be fantastic with those cards being readily available and easy to find. Playing with four, I, it just, it was one of those, like you get these blueprints and you're like, I have no idea what this means. And then you're like, late, way later, you're like, oh, there's a this. Oh, there's that. Oh, now I get it. And yeah, maybe I could have went fishing, but so that one, uh, I'm on the fence on that one. Now, jungle was fun. Lots of leisure rides, solid mix of standard upgrades that are in all of them. Very, very blueprints. To me, that was like the basic deck, like the here, here's a theme park deck. That seemed like the, a deck you'd want to put in any new game. If you're playing with new players, use the jungle. It, it, there's no special rules. You got a good diversity mix of cards. It worked great. I, I almost want to say use jungle every game, but that does kind of defeat the purpose. But it is a nice balanced deck compared to the others. Not There's a bit of take that, but not too much. I dig the jungle deck. It was fun. Now, vampires I used in the past. Um, in the past, I thought they were the most backstabby of all the decks, but that's nothing compared to ninjas. Uh, where the difference is, is vampires is more centered around the people, the... the um, the, the, the upgrades that go to the left, not the attractions, whereas the ninja was more hurting other people, not just stealing stuff like shutting down rides and assassinating people so that they're no longer in your park. Now, the problem with Unfair in this particular game of it is Tori played really well. Now, a part of this, I think, was us kind of ignoring him and me focusing on Deanna as the biggest threat because she's played before. And... Um, Kat also realizing that Dana tends to win, so kind of paying attention over there and kind of letting Tori do his own thing without realizing just how well it worked. Now, a big part of this was the fact that Deanna had that printing press, and that just seems so powerful. We're like, holy cow, she's going to get 25 bucks free per turn. And we kind of focused on that and let Tori run with it. So Tori beat us by like, I, I posted online, it's like 60 points or something ridiculous like that. And while Tori's got this thing, where every game he'll eventually play the perfect game and then once he's played the perfect game he doesn't have to play the game anymore and he is convinced he's already played the perfect game of unfair i never had to play it again i already played it perfectly i i, I couldn't do better than that so well he has said yeah okay if you need to review it i'll play it again <laughs> um he's kind of done he's like i've done it i beat unfair good game i liked it it's fun you guys go have fun well, I'd just like to pause and say thank you to Cypher yes. Unlimited Live for rating the channel. Welcome. Thank you. We're, uh, we're just going through our uh, what did we play for the week uh, section right now. Awesome to have uh, the extra folks dropping in. Yeah, we are just wrapping up, actually, where there's a very end of the show. We are going to go through the rest of the games we played this past week. Then we're going to do a little closeout. But you are welcome to stick around because we do something we like to call the Pento Suite After Show at the end of the show. So even after we sign off, stick around. And we do love interacting with the chat room. So it is tricky that Tori won't play again. But hopefully with the Tabletop Simulator mod we found, we can still get some more plays in anyway. Uh, I actually remember Vampire not being that bad when we used it in our play because knowing that it's there, you yeah. can block and, and make allowances for what you know is going to be coming if they've got those That's cards true. in hand. And that is the biggest thing about this game that is going to change over time is getting to know the decks, especially with those blueprints. Like, I'm almost wondering now that we played, the next time we sit down, we're going to go through the decks and like here and pass them to the next player and go through the decks and pass them. So you have an idea of what's there. Like, for example, I'm like, I had to take one blueprint because the goal was to have a hotel with a concierge. And I'm like, <laughs> well, I got to take that. Well, little did I know there's one concierge card and oh. Tori already hired him. Right. And I, I guess I probably could have used the right vampire cards to try to steal them, but I didn't know what those cards were. Like I, there's almost like a magic, the gathering level of, 
deck mastery in this game that I think would really put the game to the next level. Unfortunately, we're probably not going to get to that point before our review because I don't want to put it off for another six months while we master the game. But it definitely is an aspect of the game that should be considered. Right. Absolutely. Now, the next game uh, we played together was Trap Words. So it took until this game with Torian Cat for the full rules of the game to sink in. Now, as noted in the review a little bit ago, we did play Extreme in the previous games. Now, we had figured it out by the end of our game before this. This was the first game playing with the full rules. Now, we played as couples, Deanna and I versus Kat and Tori, and had a great time. The, the trap words is really, this is where it's sunk in. This is where I'm like, oh yeah, this game is good. Like, like, this is really good. And it was fun to see the difference in playing with my mother-in-law and sister-in-law and the kids than playing with Kat. That was, it was an interesting thing. Now, I am getting out of order a bit here, so I'm jumping ahead to the to Sunday, but after this success of playing Trap Words, we brought it back over to Holly and Brenda's because we wanted to go, hey, look, we played again with the proper rules. Look how much better it is, and I wanted to show off the game. And this is the time we let the kids play as well. Now, both Holly and Brenda did agree the game is much better using the proper words, um, but the most shocking thing to me was how much my kids love this game, like, like really love this game, especially my youngest. Since Sunday, we have been asked twice now, oh, do you think later we can play Trap Words? I'm like, uh, no, we have a podcast to do later, and the other day I had work to do before we get to the podcast, and I was writing up the reviews we had for tonight. So I feel bad shooting the kids down, but they really want to play again, so... I, th this is one of the few games my kids have really latched onto that we got. Well, and these two last plays, I got to admit, the review segment would have sounded completely different if we didn't get in those additional plays this last week. Like they taught me a new appreciation for the game. It went from kind of cool word game with some neat concepts, but forgettable to honestly, what's now become one of our favorite word games. And I don't expect that to change. I'm still, I have to say, on the fence about Trap Words, just hearing about it. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, when I get to play that, I'll have a uh, more solid opinion one way or the other. Yeah, we'll have to make sure it's near the top of the Sean playlist and we'll have to get in a game of Trap Words. Now that the kids are hooked, we could easily play it when you're down here. Last time we didn't, I, I honestly didn't think the kids would take to this one and they loved it. Uh, next, I just had to show uh, Cat and Tori Space Base. I thought they'd love it. They dug it. Uh, they did have some trouble with the charge cube rules, as it seems like everyone does the first game. Um, they did both enjoy it, but they didn't love it like I expected. And I don't know if it was the tone change from silly party game like Trap Words to, to, to Space Base or, or what it was. Um, I, honestly, I, I do hope to play it with them again. I think I'm sure they're willing to play it again. I think this is a game you almost need to play twice. Like, I almost want to tell anyone who plays Space Base for the first time, play two games. Like, I don't just do once. It's a fairly short game. Play twice in a row just to make sure. Um, so we'll see. We'll see if that grows on them. I, I think it will over time, but we'll see. Well, you know, it's a hard game to fall in love with on your first play. There's a lot to take in. And yes, those charge cubes are pretty much guaranteed to either confuse you or just have you choose not to take those cards yeah so you don't have to think about them yeah because i know that's what you did the first game is totally avoided them yep and realizing how important point cards are like there's there is there is a learning curve there well and also we had been playing extreme up until yes. <laughs> that's true we talked about that last week didn't we yep yep i think we did we we did so we did, tune yeah, in yeah. last week's episode to see what we got wrong you can save money round to round but only if you don't buy anything uh, final game with Cat and Tori. Um, it was getting late, like really late, like 2, 3 a.m. late. Um, we got them to agree to play one more game, but it had to be quick. So we took the chance to show off Codenames Duet. This is a game Deanna and I have been loving since we got it. This is now our favorite date Nate game. Yes, it's even replaced the Duke um, just because it's so light and more fun and relaxing. And I got to say for a date night, a little more intimate because you're guessing words with each other and cooperating. Tori and Kat loved it. Um, we ended up playing for four full rounds of the game. That game is just so good. Uh, like they left planning to pick up a copy. This uh, this game seems completely up Kat and Tori's family's alley. Uh, their uh, their mother particularly loves uh, word games of this sort, and uh, this is definitely 
uh, once they got this to the table, it was obvious that this was something that they were going to enjoy. Uh, so not a surprise there. Uh, again, I, it's another one I haven't played yet, but, uh, it'll be interesting to see, uh, when I get that one to the table as well. Next up, we are over at Brenda and Holly's place. My kids were over there. We hooked up with the kids and we sat down to play a five player game of tapestry. I've been wanting to do this since cracking tapestry open. Um, we played with my oldest daughter this time and wow, is this game a table hog like it honestly basically did not fit on their table um we had things overlapping and tech cards overlapping and then eventually people got some additional civilizations and we just stacked them like, it didn't work um i've now played this five times i think i'm up to at least i'm still having a hard time teaching this one and i honestly am not sure how to do it better i don't know i haven't found a good way to teach this game it, it's something that you kind of need to front load some stuff but you kind of don't want to like this even more so i was saying space space you should play twice in a row now you may not want to play tapestry twice in a row because it is a longer game i think you really do need to play this twice to fully get it it just doesn't make sense until you see a full game now this may be one of those, I, I don't know. I don't know a good way to do it. If you have players who are willing to read, they can just sit with a reference card on their turn and read everything, maybe. I honestly think your first game you should play to see what happens. Like, go up random tracks. Roll the die to see what track you go up on, whatever, just to kind of see how it all works. Now, that said, we dove right in. I taught it to the best of my ability, went over the basic actions for the four different tech trees and what those do and tried to explain the symbols as we were going. But it was, it was definitely a little rough. Now, Brenda and Holly did dig it. Uh, my daughter, though, did not. Uh, she just could not get into this game. And I was really surprised. I was looking forward to showing her this, especially because she really liked Battle of Gog. And what she liked about that was spreading out, founding cities, and the conflict, the using her armies to take over others. And I thought she'd really like the 4X experience that's in this game. I thought she'd dig conquering other territories, and I thought she'd love going up on tracks. Now, she did note that she had no idea why she didn't like the game. She was just like, I don't know. I just didn't like it. It was at the point at one point she actually said, she's like, if I could, I would stop playing right now. And we explained the whole thing that yes, that is valid, but you're going to ruin the game for everyone else. And if you do, like, if you need to stop, if you really hate it, we'll stop. But you should play the game to the end before you start it because you're affecting everyone else's game, everyone else's fun. So we did have that conversation. She did play through to the end. Uh, she did also do terribly. Like, I just think it was too much. It was, it was four different tracks to worry about. It was communities. It's your player board. It's your little civilization board. And there's these 3D buildings. And what the heck are those for? Like, I just think it was overwhelming. And I think she had the teenager, I feel stupid. Like, like the I'm playing with it. Everyone else seems to be getting it, but I don't. So I'm not having fun. And she did. She pl placed, like, like, well last. Like, everyone had literally lapped her on the board, some of us twice. So it's uh, uh, definitely a problem uh, for her. I don't know if we'll get her to play that one again, which is disappointing. I think she would like it. Maybe that was a step too far. I don't know. We have to take a step back and maybe play some El Grande or something first to kind of get her used to area control or play something different. Now, the other thing we found with five players was, wow, was that long? I don't know what it says in the box. We were looking at six hours. Now, there was a break for dinner in there, but we played like the first three eras, then had dinner, then finished off the last two. I was a long game night. And the other thing that was interesting is we cycled the tech deck, which is not something I thought would happen. So just something to know, if you do play Tapestry with five people, it's, excuse me, likely you'll go through all the tech deck. We also cycled the uh, hex tiles. We went through all the hex tiles in the game. We did not get through the Tapestry deck, though. So that was, that was an interesting experience. Um, I still dig the game. Like, I liked it. Tiana liked it. Holly loved it. Brenda liked it. Um, we need to play this some more. I think, uh, and maybe I'll have have Gwen watch and she'll get back into it or something. I hope she'll give it another try. So uh, Tapestry is listed. A BGG solidly puts it as best at three. Okay. Um, and uh, their the playing time on uh, there is listed as ninety to one hundred and twenty. Okay. Uh, but I remember, like we, I've only played it so far on Tabletopia, and mm -hmm. I generally hated the experience, <laughs> not the game. Yeah. The game, I think, has a lot of possibility. The experience of playing it on Tabletopia, however, 
was not fun. So yeah. I would really like to get to the, play this game in person. Uh, and I think you, me, and D sitting down and playing it as a three-player yeah. game, but in person mm -hmm. uh, could be a great experience and really give us the best experience for that game. Yeah. Um, it was, uh, yeah, and I, and I think it was long on Tabletopia too, but there was also a lot of fiddly uh, and, and trying to manage that, uh, that we got. So, so uh, Holly is in the chat room. She has corrected me. So it was six hours with both games. Okay. Now, to be fair, Trap Words was short, like half hour, 45 minutes. Right. But you're still, we're looking at five hours then, and the box is two. That, that's, that's quite the stretch. Now, again, learning game for my daughter. I, I have admitted it many times before. My daughter does have AP problems. She wants to plan out everything and not make the wrong move. Again, I think it ties into that not wanting to feel stupid thing, uh, which is fair. I, we do hope to play this with uh, Kat and Tori this weekend at four. So we'll see how that goes. Now, another thing that came out of this that I thought was hilarious, um, hopefully she doesn't get mad we're talking about this and she's in the chat room, but Holly and Deanna had a conversation after the fact, and she has decided she has found her sweet spot. She has found her gaming niche, and it ends up that it is 2.88 on BoardGameGeek. After going, wow, Guild Wars is like the perfect level of complexity for me. And then we played Tap Words. She's like, wow. Guild that, Hall. Not, Guild, not, I always do that. Not Guild, Guild Master. Guild Master is a 2.88. And then she looked up Tapestry and she loved Tapestry. She's like, oh, again, that's like just that perfect weight. Also 2.88. So it ends up that the ideal game weight for Holly is 2.88. So what we're going to have to do maybe in the after show is bring up the listings and find all the games rated exactly 2.88 and see what else I own. Now, my final game for the list was Jabuka. We just reviewed it. We just explained it. Uh, what I thought was interesting about this was the weird mix of not quite being what I expected while still being kind of what I expected and both being better and worse for it. Like, like I'm like, why, why can't I use all these letters? Oh, that's cool. They use multi-use letters. Wow, this is a lot more cutthroat than I thought. Ooh, I kind of like stealing things. Uh, I think I already covered it in the review on um, um, why I felt this way. But man, what a like a roller coaster of feelings on that game as we experienced it. Yeah, I am. Uh, Jabuka is an odd one. Now I've got my supers group started up again, and our first adventure awesome. with the new system, uh, which is again the uh, Amazing Heroes system based off Amazing Tales. Uh, went quite well. I, I don't think they're completely hooked yet. We spent a lot of time on masks, uh, but I went in action heavy on the first scene with a cold opening, a battle with a significant number of mooks uh, teasing nice. some future antagonists. Uh, so st from a story perspective, I think the entire adventure went quite well. Uh, and we just need to see what happens on a night when we do less of the full on combat to, right. to get them sold on it. So are you starting a whole new campaign story arc? Or are all, you using your existing nope. story and evolving it or a different full, group in the same full city? Cut, full, cut, full cut, full new characters, new city, full new world uh, reboot. Group uh, creation or all your creation then playing in it? Uh, this is all, this is, this is a story, uh, basically a shared narrative. So I came okay. up with the name of the city uh, right. and they helped divide, design some of the, the aspects and, and areas of the city mm -hmm. as part of their character creation. So you know, there, there's a there's a, a downtown area that was sort of right. populated in part by one character who's got that sort of thing. And we went on that way. Sounds good. All right. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? So much stuff to do. Uh, so here, here's a problem we found. So the problem with getting back to in-person gaming is I've been gaming a lot and I've been gaming a lot. So I'm not spending as much time at this desk working. Now, this is fantastic for my mental health. And it is awesome to have more games to talk about at the end of our show. And we're getting stuff done. We're a pile of obligation games. A lot of the stuff we've been playing is review copies, I all right. And yes, games is technically work. It did mean that I didn't even touch the folded space inserts we talked about last week. And I'm behind on Tabletop Bellhop blog posts. And we were actually a couple late on a couple of YouTube videos. For those of you who follow our regular schedule, a couple things released a little later than usual. Uh, so... This week's going to be about trying to reschedule my current workflow. Basically, the workflow I developed in the last two years, year and a half of being locked down, where I wasn't going out to local game events, and we weren't having people over every Friday night, and I got to make it work with the fact that we were now producing more content, like two reviews a night. So I got to figure out a rescheduling of that. So 
um, I want to still spend more time away from the table and get the games played, right? That's I can't talk about them unless we play them, but I got to figure out a way to balance that better. So to that end, I am hoping to get the Zaya insert build done this week. So again, that'll be a live stream. I'll let people know on social media and everything. Um, if it gets done by the end of the weekend, I apologize for those of you listening at home. Maybe it's already been there, but you can check it out on YouTube, hopefully by now. Uh, but I am going to do a live stream building a folded space insert for Zaya Legends of the Drift System, one of the best sci-fi sandbox games out there with amazing components that are a huge mess in my box since getting all the Kickstarter exclusives and expansions. So we're going to fix that up. We're going to do it live, and then we'll release an edited version on YouTube. So that's there. Um, I also have that back there, Draconis Invasion, that I need to unbox. And while the camera angles I'm probably going to set up for Zaya are going to be very similar to what I set up for a unboxing video. So I may mesh those two together. So start with an unboxing and then turn it into the other. We'll see. I also, um, thanks to one of our awesome Patreon patrons, AKA my mom, uh, we have a new neoprene Mac coming that is two-sided with chroma key green and blue on it. That should be way better than what I was doing for a table for the close-up shots. So that should be pretty good too. Uh, like I'm hoping to get that. So I'm almost, I might put that off until that match shows up. So if it shows up this week, we'll see. So there's definitely that. I want to get those done. I also have to publish the article on ultralight games. And if you have been paying attention, you'll know just how long ago we talked about that. You can see just quite how far behind I am on getting articles out there. All right, patrons, how about we try for a remote pan tilt zoom camera so I can just remotely yes. film Mo while he does things and he can completely ignore the production part. I, Don't I'm worry, D, you can always unplug it for privacy when he needs to share or when he needs to share deals more instead. <laughs> yeah, it's very true. Then the, I'll admit the deals. We, we, we are, please go over to uh, table at tabletop underscore deals on Twitter and look at like the three deals I posted today. And just click that before you shop on Amazon. You don't have to buy the games. Just, just buy other stuff. We would appreciate it because we are falling a bit behind on our affiliate sales. But hey, as for the actual gaming, ignoring all that work stuff and getting to the fun work stuff, uh, Tori and Kat are coming over Friday. That is set up. Good to go. That is a terrible link. <laughs> <laughs> all set up. Good to go on Friday. Uh, tapestries on deck. So we are going to do that. Uh, while they were last year, they are really excited to know us. I had a copy of Lantern Dice um that I, it's a pile of shame not obligation so all i gotta do is sit down and read the rules or maybe i'll test out what we talked about tonight and just throw it on the table now i'll read the rules ahead of time um i would like to get in at least one more round of unfair as well now that we know how to play and maybe just maybe deanna will go do something else and we'll play a three-player game of aroma and finally get the the most um a moldy game out of our <laughs> has been sitting there the longest waiting to be reviewed because it's three player only and you can't play it with kids game off our pile of shame because cat's actually really curious about it so i think we're going to break that out as a, as a as a game to play and then again sunday we are heading back over to visit the extended family i am definitely bringing unfair for that one um i'm going to bring unfair and i'm really thinking we're going to try it the, the happy version with the the global effect where you don't have all the take that nature for that first game so i think that'll be cool um plus i think at this point the kids will kill me if i don't play tra trap words and we don't play that six player again um i also have the goal to get code monkey to the table with the kids i think that'll be a quick one um i was expecting more in that box than it is in there that's all i'll say it's it, it is one game I expected a coding game to be more modular, more things to do. It is one interesting but fairly simple coding game. So we'll check that out also. Maybe check that out. And if it's like the last couple of weeks, absolutely none of that will happen. We'll be here next week, but thankfully I don't have to do show notes because we're having a big party. So maybe that'll give me some chance to catch up. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support evil john i haven't seen a snack on facebook for a while you're not grilling as much right now too hot down there and uh thank you donna our latest of the pa tabletop pa bellhop patreons courtney jackson keep sending us in those questions we're getting some great ones and thank you for joining us live every week now it's awesome to see you in the chat matt lichtenwaller thanks matt Roger Malash, game designer extraordinaire, or at least hoping to be. We're this close. This close, Roger. This close to get together. 
I keep talking to Deanna. I keep trying to push. When are we going to have a game night? When are we going to have a big game night where we have like, you know, 12, 20 people over at my house and three tables? Not quite there yet, but we're getting there. It may have to wait till February, but maybe we'll have some uh, local game store gaming start up before that. Well, that was the double bell. That means our shift is coming to an end and we're going to have to lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find our podcast on your podcatcher of choice, and sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. If you like the content we're providing, it would be awesome if you considered tipping your bellhops over at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop, where you can get some cool exclusive stuff like hours of bonus audio, including our outtakes, our after show, and now our Sunday brunch. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us. I already said that. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. (laughs) For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us. Be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. And stop by Sundays for brunch. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And game on. One final note. We have moved our Sunday brunch to 1 p.m. now instead of noon. Quick heads up. This should have been in the announcement section, but I didn't think of it until just now. Well, I'm Thank Sean. Thank you. And... Game on.